So, in no particular order, we have Tom Rogers, who is a teacher, blogger, resources writer, tweeter, um, and writes weekly for the TES. Tez. So, without further ado, I'm going to go Tom Rogers. Thank you. Um, just to start off with to say thanks for, for Ed and the TES for the opportunity to come here and, and speak to, to everybody today. Um, it saddens me, actually, that we're at a debate, which is how do we keep teachers teaching? Because for me, teaching is the best profession in this country. It's a profession where you are surrounded by children who, for the, the vast majority of children I've ever taught, want to learn. They want to do well. You're not going to speak to a child and ask them if they want to fail and then say yes. The vast majority of children want to succeed. And I've, I've loved teaching and I come from a family of teachers. But one day, in 2015, I woke up and I, I couldn't do it anymore. I just sat there and said, I can't get out of this bed. Mentally, physically, I was finished. Um, and at that point, I decided to quit the profession. At a point where I just moved up to expert. At a point where I was a head of department in a successful school, I decided to quit the profession completely. Um, and the question is, why? Why are, and, and I'm not holding myself up here as superstar teacher, I'm, I'm just an ordinary guy, essentially, um, you know, ordinary teacher. Um, but I'm saying, why are so many teachers like me leaving the profession? And the answer really, in my view, is to get away from the superficial stuff, to get away from the stuff on the surface, the, the branches of the tree and to actually look at the root of the problem. And the root of the problem is this, very simply. There is an accountability measure in this country on teachers and schools. The accountability measure is, we are going to judge you on your students' results. That accountability measure is coming from the government. That accountability measure is delivered by their enforcers, Ofsted, who enforce that accountability measure every single day, every single year, on teachers in this country. And when they enforce that accountability measure, there's two problems. One is, that accountability measure is based on the misconception that teachers actually impact their student results as much as we as a society have convinced ourselves that they do. Research tells us, and I will talk about that later, that that simply is not the case. Yet, Ofsted, outcomes trump everything. Hence, you get your work scrutinies you get your lesson observations, you get your pupil progress meetings, you get questions fired at NQTs, why is X not making enough progress in your classroom? We are wasting the best teachers we've got in this country for no reason whatsoever, and we need to stop doing it. This is interesting. Um, <laughs> this is a mic, but not as I know it. Um, I'll do all that again to make sure people can hear me. So I'm Anna Trithiwi and I work at LKM Co. And we've done some research into why teachers stay in the profession and why they leave. And one of the reasons that they do that is because they feel good at it. And I want to ask you, what is some of the best professional development that you have had access to in schools or out? You touched on it a little bit, um, but I'd be interested to hear what that would be and why it was. Tom. A vast amount of, of CPD available to teachers now. You've got fantastic organisations like Research Ed, um, I, uh, TM History Icons, which is, I don't want to say, but I set up. <laughs> <laughs> but it's free for teachers, um, Research Ed, and, and other organisations that do that. And uh, the, there's a huge amount now available to teachers. But the issue, to come back to you, is about time. It's about decision making in schools. And, and I think. I hate to mention them again because there's an outstanding banner at the back. Um, but Ofsted have, have asked um, ha, the, the priority for school, for school leaders at the moment is ensuring their students make enough progress and ensuring, and, and for, for schools, it's about evidencing that. And the time for CPD to, to sit and actually talk about teaching is being usurped by hours writing down comments that are often copied and pasted about the progress of students that probably doesn't actually exist in the first place. It is a paper exercise, and therefore, we end up with um, nothingness. 
We end up with teachers giving up their weekends, their Saturdays and Sundays, to go to teaching events, buying their own train tickets to improve their professional development. Because in school, they're in the rat race of seven lessons, bang, 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 and then a meeting asking them why they haven't taught those children well enough. Sometimes. And I have to put sometimes on the end, because there are some absolutely amazing school leaders out there, many of whom I've worked with, many I still work with, because I now teach in Spain, where the vast majority of the staff in my school haven't gone there for the money, haven't gone there for the sunshine, have left their homes behind because they want to teach in an environment where CPD matters, where their professional development matters. And then when they finished their long day's work, when they've taught their seven lessons and they've done their two-hour twilight CPD session, they get a well done. They get a thanks very much. It's a sort of kind of a three-fold question that I, I thought about. Go, go back a bit. Oh, is that the, that's the op optimal distance? Got it. Uh, yeah, no, it is, yeah, um, if I can. Firstly, the thing that struck me is that we're, we're equipping students for a modern world. Um, should we therefore be not surprised that teaching is no longer a, a career for life? Secondly, being a teacher that after five years of um, experience, which led me into the mental health issues which you spoke about, and considering leaving the profession, only to change tack in the profession and find it still to be wonderful in a very different setting of a pro in Islington. The thing that I've reflected upon from that is that it's not the kids that maybe want to quit. It's not the Ofsted pressure that maybe want to quit. It was the senior leaders that I'd been subjected to that maybe want to quit that had misunderstood the pressure from Ofsted and therefore applied that pressure to their staff. So to what extent does the panel think that the, the pressure to um, succeed and the pressure to do more comes from poorly equipped senior leadership or from the Ofsted pressure? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I feel like that might resonate with you, Tom. Yeah, um, I, I'm going to disagree there. Oh. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, because Ofsted has been very clever. Um, in recent times because they've, they've launched what I would call a propaganda campaign against senior leaders um, to basically shift the blame from their own accountability measure, which I'll go into in a second, to say, you've misinterpreted us. You're misinterpreting us. You're, you're, you're not quite understanding what we want you to do. But the problem is they've been changing what they've wanted schools to do on a yearly, bi-yearly basis for 20 years since my mum and dad were teaching. So schools are a little bit confused about what they should be doing, and suddenly Ofsted have described the last 20 years as myths. It's, it's all myths. Everything that's happened um, is, is just a myth. So be calm. Be calm and be measured. But the bottom line is that schools are being judged in deprived areas in the same way as the schools that are being judged in the leafy suburbs, where private tutors are readily available, where children have access to the kind of cultural capital that, that students in some of the most deprived areas of London do not have access to. There are totally committed teachers working day on day, week on week, year on year, in some of the toughest neighborhoods in this country, and they're being judged in exactly the same way as their peers who work in delightful areas and, and schools. And that's wrong. It's morally wrong. There needs to be context, and at the moment, there is not. Because there is a direct correlation between Ofsted gradings and the progress and attainment scores of schools. Let me read you a little statistic. Out of 735 schools that were inspected between September 2016 and August 2017, where the progress 8 measure was low, only 3% of those schools got a good rating. I'm sorry, but a lot of requires improvement schools are doing exactly the same thing as their good and outstanding counterparts. They're doing the same policies, they have the same quality of teachers, but they're penalized because of their students' results. And we know according to King's College London in a 2013 survey that 55% of student attainment at GCSE level can be attributed to, quote, hereditary factors. 
55 percent. Yeah, that's right. Can I just say thank you to the panel as well, just for getting really honest uh, commentary, really, from, the, from their thoughts. I'm interested in the idea of, of collaboration, because one of the things that our teachers tell us around the world is that it's teachers working with teachers that makes the difference. That's really where you get the teacher agency, and often that sense of people being really energised. So I'd be really just interested in hearing from colleagues around how do you find the best way to connect with, with other colleagues, probably outside of your school, because it's quite easy to connect with people in your school? What have you found the best ways to connect with others, and what have you got out of that as well? Do you agree, Tom? I do, Ed. Um, Twitter, Twitter, Twitter has been amazing for me. Um, I've, I've met so many incredible teachers through that, through that little blue bird and, and I was incredibly sceptical um, when I first joined it. My mate said, what are you doing going on that? Um, and, and I went on it and, and I met some incredible people who, who I've had the privilege of, of organising events with, of talking about teaching with, talking about stuff that matters with. It's been absolutely amazing and I've learned so much uh, you know, from other people through that network so I can't advise enough to, to join it and um, yeah, and, and that's, that's it for me. I'm, I'm going to go to social media. I'm sorry, I know there are lots of hands. But, um, um, one Carly Waterman comments, um, being valued comes top when I do small-scale workload case studies in schools. It's above even workload and accountability. It's a human need to feel valued, recognised and appreciated. Uh, and that was another question I was sort of pondering on the way down here about um, the respect for the profession and the extent to which it, if the profession felt more valued, they might even be able to stomach uh, the workload community and of course I think, I think part of it as well is understanding because the people involved in the, in, the, in the leadership in education, most of them haven't been teachers at all and that's no disrespect to Natasha by the way who's absolutely sensationally good at what she does so it's not a, a comment towards, but in, in educational policy making areas we have a head of Ofsted who's never taught a lesson You've just mentioned Ofsted <laughs> Thank you, whoever it was Boom, boom um, because, you know, I'm, I think we're here to talk about why teachers quit teaching. Yeah. And, and for me, we can, I mean, connectivity is fabulous, and, and as teachers, we love it. But at the end of the day, the reason they quit is because they're not trusted or valued. The government put, as I've mentioned, an accountability measure that is strictly based on data and results onto school leadership teams who, some are young and inexperienced, Others are experienced, all of them are under pressure, and they make, they create 20 policies. They don't trust their teachers because of the stakes on their own jobs. Natasha. <laughs> uh, well, I'm going to attempt to manoeuvre the conversation vaguely in the direction of solutions. Um, on Twitter, one or two people have mentioned um, technology, and it is something the government in the UK is just beginning to look at, and whether it might hold some of the solutions um, to the work, specifically, I think, to the workload crisis and therefore retention. Tom. I think technology, I'm very pro technology, I think technology can play a massive role in reducing teachers' workload in schools. I also think different forms of marking and assessment can reduce teachers' workload in schools. I also think that positive leadership in schools can reduce workload. But fundamentally, it's not going to stop the root of the problem. And the root of the problem is judging schools coldly on data and results. That is the root of the problem. And, and I'm very sorry, but Damien Hines, if you're watching this, can deal with this problem by picking up his pay. It's not going to cost them. I know we talked about money, and, and I understand that. And money's another one that can reduce workload because you reduce class sizes. But it's not going to solve the problem. The problem is we are coldly judging teachers and schools based on the results of students, which has no evidence base to do. When we stop doing that, and Damien Hines could do it tomorrow by picking up a pen and saying, Ofsted, I'm ordering you to stop judging schools based on outcomes. And as I mentioned earlier, 90% of schools, 98% of schools are judged just on that, based on that. Stop doing that, and all the book scrutinies, all those senior leaders are going, we've got to prove that we're doing our jobs. We've got to prove that Angela in the corridor down there is a good teacher. We've got to prove that we're good at our jobs. Suddenly, they are liberated. They can just say to, to their teachers, let's concentrate on good teaching and learning. Let's concentrate on creating a holistic environment for the students in our school to flourish. 
Let's not concentrate on cold, hard data that we have a 15 percent. Uh, that's not to say results aren't important. I'm not, I'm not saying that we don't want students to achieve. I'm talking about the accountability system. Good. Tom. Um, I don't think this is about money. I'm going to, we'll make it a debate. <laughs> but I, 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 I respect that for you. But I don't think this is about money. Um, why aren't we asking parents what they want? Because Ofsted did. Just this month, actually, they released their survey. And in that survey, they asked parents how they wanted their schools to be judged. And in the top four, child does not get bullied. Behavior, school ethos. The first mention of progress, the word progress, was at the 32% mark. That's what 70% of parents, that's not in their top priorities here. They want their child to be safe. They want them to enjoy schools. Catherine Burble Singh, head teacher of Michaela, one of the most influential people in education today, wants to allow parents into her school. Her solution is, Ofsted bye-bye. What do parents want out of my school? What do they want? Why are we asking parents what they want? Politicians are speaking to each other about what they want because presumably you know, that they feel well qualified. Dramatic. Ofsted, Ofsted, <laughs> hashtag Ofsted. Um, I'm, I'm finished, I'm finished. Right, um, <laughs> one of the great things about the chairman is you get to ask the last question. The last question I'm going to ask, which is also going to be the roundup, is going to be very simple but very difficult. I'm going to start with you, Tom, and run along, which is one thing in one minute, and I guess you're allowed to mention Ofsted, uh, which would reduce the number of teachers leaving the profession. Radically reform the accountability measure that is used and radically alter or abolish its chief enforcer, Ofsted. <laughs>